Well, my name's Jake Thompson, and I'm a nuclear engineer working uh, for Rolls-Royce Submarines. Um, I've been working there for about the last uh, six years, uh, mainly on the, um, the design of a new nuclear reactor for the Vanguard uh, class replacement. Uh, but this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about a different design, uh, the development of nuclear submarine technology by the Indian Navy. Um, on July the 26th last year, the Indian Navy launched their first indigenously designed and built nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, this now puts India in, in a unique club uh, of only five other nations with homegrown nuclear-powered te submarine technology. Uh, incidentally, those five nations are the five permanent uh, nations of the UN Security Council, uh, the UK, the USA, Russia, China, and France. This is obviously a big investment in technology and capability for India, um, but what implications does this have for, uh, for India, for the region as a whole, and the stability of the Indian Ocean? which is there. Okay, so uh, I like pretty pictures of submarines. Uh, I hope you do, because there's quite a few of them. Um, that's the INS Arihant, India's first nuclear-powered submarine. And that picture uh, on the left is taken from the Indian Department for Atomic Energy. The uh, Indian naval ship Arihant uh, is a ballistic missile um, nuclear-powered submarine powered by uh, an Indian-designed pressurized water reactor. Uh, the vessel is about 111 meters long, uh, with approximately 6,000 tons displacement. It's reported that the submarine can carry up to 12 Indian-designed ballistic missiles, each with a range of about 700 kilometers that are designed to carry Indian nuclear warheads. This vessel now completes India's nuclear triad. They now have the capability to launch nuclear weapons from the air, the land, and, and now the sea. So being part of a, a, a new reactor design in the UK Naval Nuclear Program, uh, I know uh, all, all too well some days just how hard and complex a job it is to design a nuclear reactor. A new design requires hundreds of highly qualified uh, scientists and engineers, uh, not just nuclear physicists, but uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, material scientists, and believe me, the list goes on. Um, and uh, again, I don't say this at work, but uh, the design process is actually probably the easy bit. Uh, proving that design will work and being able to build that reactor and that submarine uh, are really the hard bits. And they, again, require huge levels of investment in skilled, uh, skilled resource, experimental programs, and also infrastructure projects. Uh, the Indian design has been, uh, has been no exception to this. And in fact, they've had to do pretty much everything from scratch, um, though they've probably had some guidance from, from the Russians. Uh, the whole advanced technology vessel, as this project was known, uh, to design and build their own nuclear submarine uh, has taken a huge level of investment and commitment from the Indian government. Um, from inception to launch, the project has taken nearly 30 years uh, and involved many different uh, research establishments uh, across India. India is also deep in the process of developing commercial nuclear power, uh, but it's worth noting at this point that this project is not simply a piggyback onto other existing ventures. The technology uh, development for this submarine pressurized water reactor is quite different from the, uh, the technology being developed for uh, the Indian civil nuclear program uh, to, to close their fuel cycle. To give you a scale of the investment, uh, on the slide there is a picture of the Indian naval PWR prototype. Uh, this is a land-based, full-size and full-power test reactor that the Indian Navy have been using to train naval reactor plant operators and also prove that they could design this plant and fit it into a submarine hull. Uh, for those in the audience familiar with the UK uh, naval nuclear pro prototype at uh, Doomray, uh, there's some striking similarities there. Um, also to support the indigenous growth into a nuclear navy, um, the Indian Navy uh, has leased a Russian nuclear submarine uh, and a Kula 2 class hunter-killer submarine uh, for a period of up to 10 years. Uh, they plan to use this submarine for crew training uh, to gain experience of uh, operating and maintaining uh, a nuclear submarine. So why have India invested so much, uh, so much money uh, into the development of nuclear-powered submarines? Uh, it's by no means cheap. Um, so, so what does that actually give them? Well, the Indian policy on, uh, on nuclear weapons has always been a no-first-use stance, i.e. a nuclear deterrent. Their missiles are only there to provide a means of nuclear retaliation, um, thus hopefully preventing an attack in the first place. Uh, but in order for this policy to work and deter potential enemies from a nuclear attack, the Indian nuclear capability needs to be credible, uh, by which I mean the system needs to be capable of delivering retaliation after a nuclear attack. This is the so-called second strike capability. 
Uh, submarines are an excellent platform to provide this second strike capability uh, because by their very nature, they, uh, they lurk unseen and unheard under the seas and so cannot be detected uh, and thus be rendered incapable during a first strike. Uh, a nuclear-powered submarine um, is not restricted by the charge of its batteries or the requirements for air and so can stay submerged for much longer periods of time um, and importantly stay undetected for much longer periods of time. As I've already mentioned, this submarine uh, and the three more in class to follow uh, will complete India's nuclear triad capability. Uh, but India could already launch nuclear missiles from aircraft and, uh, and the land. Um, so this submarine, I don't believe, um, signifies a change in the deterrent policy. Uh, it just strengthens the credibility of that policy. It does not increase the nuclear threat to old local foes such as Pakistan, but it does significantly increase the threshold for a first strike against India. Um, with India's economic growth and development, uh, the country is starting to grow up and expand its horizons, uh, certainly at a regional level, but also internationally. Uh, so what does this launch uh, mean, for the India, uh, mean for the Indian Ocean region uh, as a whole? At a regional level, India sits uh, in a pretty unique location, uh, landlocked to the north with two huge coastlines running down into the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean itself is the third largest ocean in the world and covers uh, a sixth of the, uh, of the Earth's surface. It provides a link between Asia to the east and Europe to the west, and as such, a high percentage of the world's commercial maritime traffic flows through the Indian Ocean. However, the Indian Ocean is also surrounded on three sides by landmass, and so access to the ocean is limited uh, through several narrow channels. Uh, the Suez Canal and the Straits of Babel Mandeb uh, to the, to the west, to the Cape of Good Hope to the south, and the Malacca Straits to the east. Since so much commercial traffic passes through these choke points and across the Indian Ocean, the stability um, of this ocean is of uh, vital imp uh, importance to global stability uh, and is, is of great interest to the growing uh, powers within the region, namely uh, India and China. US naval and maritime strategist Alfred Mahan said, uh, whoever controls the Indian Ocean will dominate Asia. Uh, the Indian Ocean is key to the seven seas in the 21st century, and the destination, destiny of the world will be decided upon its waters. With that in mind, 80% uh, of Chinese oil imports pass through the Indian Ocean, not to mention the vast commercial tonnage of Chinese exports heading the other way uh, to Europe and the eastern seaboard of the United States. The importance of the Indian Ocean to China and Chinese economic growth uh, cannot be underestimated and Beijing is, uh, is aware of this. Over the past few years, China have been investing heavily in infrastructure projects, commercial ventures, and building diplomatic ties uh, across the Indian Ocean region. They've been building and financing ports, airfields, technology cities, and other modernization projects um, on island chains along the main shipping lanes, giving China a presence and an economic foothold within the region. This is known as, as the String of Pearls, and ranges from the Chinese mainland all the way to the Persian Gulf. Historically, the development of the Chinese Navy has always lagged behind the, the huge growth of the People's Liberation Army. Uh, though as China grew and their economy became increasingly uh, dependent on imports and exports, in the mid-90s, China embarked on a, um, a massive ex, uh, naval modernization project. Uh, this involved building um, a new modern fleet of surface ships, but also involved the development of nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The to support the String of Pearls uh, policy and project Chinese power into the Indian Ocean, uh, Chinese, the Chinese have also recently built a base for their nuclear missile submarines on the southern tip of Hainan Island, which is just 1,200 nautical miles from the Malacca Straits and the gateway for them to the Indian Ocean. However, I don't believe that the launch of the INS Arihant is in direct answer to the naval threat posed by the Chinese within the Indian Ocean. Both countries already had a nuclear deterrent, and the natural progression of technology is to put that nuclear deterrent onto a submarine platform. Both India and China are developing and growing rapidly, uh, although China is somewhat ahead. As such, both countries are naturally growing and modernizing their armed forces, uh, including their naval strengths. So I don't believe we're seeing a regional arms race or a struggle for power in the Indian Ocean, uh, at least not yet. And having said all that, um, on the day after the launch of the INS Arihant, uh, there were several reports coming out of Pakistan 
uh, as a clear uh, reaction to the launch, saying that uh, Pakistan were going to pursue nuclear submarine technology themselves and hope to have a vessel in the water by 2020. In contrast to the natural progression of India, uh, this would be a huge leap in technology for Pakistan uh, and would be practically impossible on those timescales, uh, at least without significant outside help. So in conclusion, um, I believe the launch of the first homegrown uh, Indian nuclear submarine marks a great technological achievement for India, uh, but it does not mark a step change in their nuclear deterrence policy uh, or their military, military posture within the Indian Ocean region. India as a whole is growing and developing with technological achievements in many fields. Uh, this launch is another example of modern Indian technology and a sign that India is growing and developing into, uh, into a regional power. Thank you for listening.